Good afternoon. I'm Donna Hale, and I'm here today with Dr. Dorothy Bracey from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice Graduate Center, City University of New York. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to interview Dr. Bracey about her contributions to the field of criminal justice and criminology. I'd like to begin first by asking Dorothy, Dorothy, how did you become involved in criminology and criminal justice? By accident. Um, I was an anthropologist and had wanted to be an anthropologist long before I knew that there was a title for what I wanted to do and that you could actually earn a living, mm -hmm. however meager, um, by doing it. And so I did my graduate work in anthropology and, and social relations, did field work on the effects of male absence in a village in Hong Kong, and um, then started looking for a job. And a really interesting offer that I got was from this place that at the first letterhead still said the College of Police Science. And by the time I got there, it was John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. And I was hired to teach anthropology. The um, accrediting committee had suggested that that be added to the curriculum. And so I taught very traditional anthropology courses. Um, but I found out very quickly that the, that the best stories were always told by the faculty in the criminal justice department, particularly the ex-cops. Um, and anthropologists love stories. Mm -hmm. They sure do. Um, so that's where I started hanging out, listening at first. And um, then every once in a while, when something would come up, I'd start to mutter that anthropology could make a contribution to that. And finally, a few people suggested that I put my money where my mouth was. Mm -hmm. I did, a, did some writing in, um, in the areas of trying to combine anthropology and criminal justice, and suddenly I found that's what I was doing. Where did, where did you get your do receive your doctor from, Dorothy? The Department of Social Relations at Harvard. And that was good preparation, because in addition to, to anthropology, which is what I did, the, the, the program there uh, also called for doing some work in soci sociology and, um, and social and cultural psych uh, psychology. Um, so that it was a broad social science background, which has been, been really valuable. There's a lot of discussion presently in the academy about what is criminal justice, and we've been talking, at least today, presently in, in some of our other sessions, that uh, criminal justice benefits because it is interdisciplinary, and certainly um, you are an example of that, someone from anthropology coming into criminal justice, and I believe, what was it, in, in the 70s when you came to, yes. to John Jay? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, at a time when the field was very young. And I really hope that, that um, people in criminal justice don't um, I hope they spend a lot of time discussing that topic and don't ever come to a conclusion because having those boundaries vague, I think, is one of the, the good things about the field. Mm -hmm. I was at a, a number of years ago, I was at a, a week-long meeting on, on victimology where people were talking about, you know, what was victimology. Mm -hmm. And we ended up talking to the people at the conference center about that who said the week before there had been a meeting of, of chemists who found themselves talking about what was chemistry. And their decision was, chemistry is what chemists do. And I thought, if that was the best that chemists could do, we should just relax. Mm -hmm. Criminal justice is what people in criminal justice do. We wanted to ask a few questions just about how, how did your personal life contribute to your intellectual development? I think the most important thing was that I always had a desire to, to see other cultures, mm -hmm. to be in other places. Um, when I was little, I was told that if you dug straight through the world, you'd come out in China. And, and our backyard was just full of holes of me <laughs> trying, to, trying to do that. Um, and that was when I realized that wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I realized I'd have to get to China some other way. And, and again, that was part of the attraction to anthropology. Um, not just a matter of wanting to travel, though that was part of it, but a matter of really wanting to spend enough time in cultures and, as I later became to understand, subcultures, um, to really try to understand the way in which that worked. Mm -hmm. So as I found myself being drawn to, to criminal justice, the two things involved. One, one, to look at organizations as cultures. To, so my, my study of police has always been to, to study police the way that when I was a, 
a grad student, I, I, I studied Chinese mm -hmm. villages, um, and also the, the comparative um, approach. Um, and I think that was, and the, the desire to see connections, mm -hmm. perhaps that characterizes my work as much as anything. Um, I've occasionally teased about myself about the fact that my career has been incredibly broad and, and not deep at all. Um, but I'm not sure that's bad, mm. and I've certainly, I've certainly liked it that way. Well, it's the old um, argument that I've heard before about, is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? And I agree with you, Dorothy, that I think sometimes when we become a specialist, that we become so narrow um, that it's not a very good idea. So in, in fact, it's when you're a generalist, you can do many more different areas. And a lot of that's connected with just the, air, the way that we do our research. And certainly in criminal justice, you've probably heard that discussion between qualitative versus quantitative uh, research. So as an anthropologist, I think it would be interesting to have you comment about how do you see the contributions of qualitative research to the field of criminal justice since you come from a truly qualitative background? Well, the first thing I have to say is that I think research benefits when those things are well integrated. Mm -hmm. Um, that you that there should be that one should be asking the questions that the other one answers that mm -hmm. you know the the field work the exploratory study um, that the totally qualitative approach um, if it's good should be generating hypotheses mm -hmm. and those hypotheses then can then be tested in a quantitative manner and if there's confirmation of the hypotheses then you then you go back to the field to look for the causal nexus be because the quantitative thing can mm -hmm. never explain to you why A and B vary together. That calls for qualitative work again. So that at best, for the field, not, not always for every single individual to master both, but for the field is for uh, hypotheses to be thrown up, hypotheses to be tested, answers to be looked for. That sends you back mm -hmm. then to try to refine all of that. Um, so that one of the reasons for being up on the literature, for being involved in it, and if you're a qualitative person to be reading the quantitative, mm -hmm. and vice versa, obviously, is to look for that next step and say, can, can I take it? Can I follow up on what that qualitatively oriented person has, has done? Uh, but in terms First of all, of, of real explanation, of trying to find out what's in the black box. Mm -hmm. I think that is certainly one of the things that, that, that um, qualitative research makes a real contribution to. And the other is, I think, for many of us, certainly, it makes it more interesting. It adds the texture. It adds the richness. It adds the people. And, and mm -hmm. basically, we're, we're about people. Uh, sometimes in reading journals, I've had to say, you know, we, we in criminology, criminal justice, we, we talk about violence, we talk about sex, we talk about greed, and we make these things so dull, which mm -hmm. takes really hard work when you, sure, when yeah. you think about it. Um, and I think that uh, good, and I do mean good, qualitative research can, can put the details back, put the interest back, put the, put, put the, um, the people back in it. Um, but I think sometimes there's been a tendency to be sloppy about qualitative research. I mean, I keep trying to tell my students that it's something more than just hanging around. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it calls for a rigor and a discipline and back to that idea of a constant interaction uh, with the quantifiable. Listen to you talk about the hanging around reminds me of, of Tally's Corner and as well as uh, uh, William Foot, William Foot Wide Street Corner Society, um, and it leads me to the question about who who influenced your work. Uh, was there classics in the field that you read that you uh, believe led you on to try and perhaps replicate that type of research to criminal justice? Well, certainly the two that you that you mentioned were were very important. Um, during my graduate work, it was a sociologist slash anthropologist by the name of Ezra Vogel, who was probably the greatest influence um, on my work. He, he, did, um, he did a lot of work in Japan, including some work with Japanese police, which, um, which I found tremendously interesting and valuable. And when I came to John Jay, I remembered his work on police, which made me feel that, that maybe there was something that I could do there. 
um, the works you mentioned, certainly uh, Donald Black, perhaps, mm -hmm. is, a, is another uh, formative influence. The, the idea that, that one could take um, the kind of theories and, and methods that I learned as an anthropologist and apply them mm -hmm. to problems and situations in criminal justice. So talking about Donald Black's customs and manners of police. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and his work on law, in fact, mm -hmm. the, and the, this, this kind of semi-quantitative, but not quite, mm -hmm. um, approach. Um, it's, it's the sort of thing that I, that I, mm -hmm. that I found interesting and valuable. But, but yes, I mean, something like manners and customs mm -hmm. of, the, of the police, tremendously a uh, good example for me, I think, and the, and the idea that, um, that organizations, including police organizations, mm -hmm. were studyable by the techniques that I've learned. Um, now that everybody throws terms like, like organizational culture mm -hmm. around. Those are certainly and, and, has sto them. and has stolen them from us that's anthropologists. That's true. Which is like the work of Van Manen that Van Manen did where uh, John Van Manen yeah. uh, went into the police academy and went through the academy and then he was one of one of them he was mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. participant observer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he felt that similar to Kirkham who, who did that type mm -hmm. of work where you had to be a police officer you had to be recognized as one before you could you know really be accepted by the group how did you approach that methodologically when you studied police did you feel that you needed to do that or that you could just come in as a as an observer uh, and and uh, study what police do, and then mm -hmm. make it's a, it's on another it. approach. And you know, back to to my to my feeling that there's no one there's no one method which is mm -hmm. the right method. In in fact, um, you, it's not even a matter of triangulation. It's quadrangulation and dozen angulation. Um, we can't ever approach directly whatever it is we're studying. It's not that, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. What we need to do is come at it from as many angles as we possibly can. Um, and, and certainly the, you know, the, the, the kind of classical participant observation, in a way, that, that, um, Manning, uh, that uh, Van Manen did and that Kirkham did are, are terribly important. Um, and certainly, to some extent, Kirkham's work, though, also throws up some of the problems of it. One of the things that we anthropologists are so often uh, cautioned about as students, and there are a number of people in the field who have pointed out to us as the example mm -hmm. um, of, what, of what happens um, when you become co-opted, when you start identifying totally with mm -hmm. the people that, you, uh, that you're studying, and, and the participant simply overwhelms the observer. Mm -hmm. um, and for many of us, that's a, that's a delicate point, and there are, there are a number of, of things in that, including uh, the, whole, the whole question of deception. Uh, um, you know, if, 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 if you are studying the police by becoming a recruit, well, you're not, that, you're not there to become a recruit. You're there to study the police. Mm -hmm. who, you know, who knows that? Who do you tell that to? How honest mm -hmm. are you about it? Um, and, and, you know, is it, is it right to lie under those mm -hmm. those circumstances? Um, I never felt the need or, or the desire, for that matter, mm -hmm. to do any anything of that kind. I was never more than an observer, making it very mm -hmm. clear that I that I was um, trying to be a sympathetic one. And, and because I I tended to be, I, you know, I was not there ever. I've never done work as a in, in, the, in the form of an investigative reporter. Mm -hmm. I was never trying to find out secrets that people mm -hmm. were trying to hide. I was trying to understand the way things worked, and I think that was what I was trying to, to get across. And I never found it, I don't think it was really a problem. The truth is most people like to talk about mm -hmm. what they do. It reminds me of your, your talking about anthropology in our discussion today on the methodologies of anthropologists reminds me of the work of uh, Elizabeth Rusiani, who, yeah. uh, if I, my memory serves me correctly, she has a master's degree in anthropology, but she too has done um, qualitative research mm -hmm. in the field of policing as well. Um, and since we're women, and I also study uh, policing, that, that in our field that's unusual because you're women, you're, first of all, you're women, and secondly, and maybe more importantly, you're not a police officer, so that the issues of, of uh, acceptance and credibility by the police officers mm -hmm. to to share with you information. Uh, have you ever uh, met with Dr. Uh, with I'm um, excuse me with Miss Ianni? 
um, and yes, talk about so, her research as although well? not recently, though it's interesting. I was just teaching her work mm -hmm. um, Monday night, as, as a matter of fact. Um, to some extent, I think if you, if you're not going to be a police officer and do research on police, then being a woman is, I think, in some ways, has been an absolute asset. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know if that'll be true as, as the number of, of women police officers grows. That, that may um, offset it a little bit. But for one thing, you know, we don't have to prove our masculinity mm -hmm. to the cops. We, we, you know, they, they don't look down on us for, for not being mm -hmm. police officers. They don't worry about our, our courage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if they think of, of, of professors as being kind of a not terribly masculine profession mm -hmm. compared to theirs, well, that's all right, because no one expects us to be terribly sure, masculine. Yes. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the thing that I've tried to do the, the hardest is make it clear to them that I'm very good at what I do and don't know anything at all about what they mm -hmm. do. Um, I'm, I have no suggestions. <laughs> mm -hmm. For them, I, I you know I, I come in total ignorance and totally aware of it. Um, so that you're learning from them, which is what yeah, an anthropologist is doing, exactly. is learning the culture, right? And um, you know, uh, sometimes sort of make it clear if you you know if you come into my classroom, then then I'm in charge mm -hmm. and I expect to be called professor. Mm -hmm. um, but if when I come onto your turf, it's 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 mm -hmm. the opposite. Um, you're the people who know, and 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 I'm the totally naive. Person. Now, yes, sometimes people want to say, "All right, you're naive." Well, you know, we'll take advantage of, of your mm -hmm. naive type. But I think, to some extent, that's where the long-term work comes in. Um, people can only try to put it over on you for so long; it gets tiring mm -hmm. after a while. Uh, you know, lying, acting mm -hmm. is always kind of wearing, mm -hmm. and, and you can do it, and it's fun for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if a person is there all the time, you know, after a while, you just you just let the guard down and be honest. And I said back again to the fact that I've never, I've never tried to get at things that people are trying to keep secret. Mm -hmm. You know, for all I know, um, people that I studied were horribly corrupt and mm -hmm. something like that. But unless I happened to be actually studying corruption, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't care about about that. Um, I wanted their opinions. That was one of the things mm -hmm. that I was interested in. Um, if their opinions weren't their true opinions, well, that was interesting, too. That's part mm -hmm. of the culture, too. What is it the way things are supposed to look like? Mm -hmm. What are you supposed to say under these circumstances? And I think the longer I've been there, and that's why not just one study, but making decades of, of, of working with police officers in, in, in different parts of the country, in different countries, just makes it makes it a little bit easier, I think, to know when they're saying what they're supposed to say and what they should say. Though I'm never I'm never mm -hmm. quite sure, and and th and that's okay. Thank you. It must be very exciting for for an anthropologist, particularly now with this new field of study called organizational culture that began about 1984. As Stephen Ott talks about it in his organizational culture book, and when we teach it to our students, we at least I know I do, and I'm sure you do as well, talk to our students about the anthropological approach and that you're studying a culture. So an anthropologist, it takes them about 18 months to, to do that field study. And the first thing is being um, accepted uh, within the culture before you can find out mm -hmm. how this particular culture operates. Uh, with the field of organizational culture now, where we go back and look at an organization where these ideas came from and the basic as assumptions and how do cultures change? Um, do you think there's a role for anthropologists or people that are qualitative criminal justice, people like myself, that we can go into uh, police departments or correctional agencies and study, you know, sort of like where, where, you, where you started, where you are, and where you're going? Um, how can anthropology help us with that? Well, I think that's actually becoming kind of chic, which is probably the kiss of death mm -hmm. for, the, for the whole field and the whole approach. Uh, I think a lot of people have come to the conclusion that there is only so much that surveys and, and other kinds of quantitative work can do. Not that they want to throw it over to totally, but that they want to do it, uh, but that it needs to be complemented. And that also that, that culture, ideas, symbols, beliefs, values, 
really do have something to do with the way that people act, mm -hmm. I, I think is something that, um, that people are becoming more and more aware of. I know a lot of the people I know who are applied anthropologists who, who work with organizations. There's this feeling they have to prove it every single time. Um, you always have to sell your, yourself mm -hmm. in, in doing this. But that the results are very often most, most gratifying. Um, many years ago, I did a, a study of juvenile prostitution in New York, um, and that, w that was a funded study. And when I handed in my final report, the, the man who was, um, who I reported to, mm -hmm. in, in, in effect, asked, asked me to come down to his office, which, where we've met many times. Um, and he, I'll never forget this, he, he, he leaned to the bookshelf behind him, and he, you know, not even looking, he pulled mm -hmm. a book out, and he flipped it open, and it was charts, one kind after the other, and he said, this is what it's supposed to look like. And um, on that meeting, I couldn't really persuade him that that was only one possible way mm -hmm. for it to look like. But what happened was that other people, including people who, who worked in the field, including police officers, r read what I wrote and, and were saying things like, yeah, that's the way I always saw it, but I didn't mm -hmm. have the words, you know, mm -hmm. or that, that sort of thing. And that, that kind of persuaded him, and, 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 and he, he was turned, as, mm -hmm. as we say in the police mm -hmm. field. Uh, and um, the other wonderful opportunity I had on something like this, I did a, I was doing what was an evaluation, actually, of an NIJ-funded project um, in a criminal justice organization in, in New York City. And in that one, they collected a tremendous amount of data. And so there was, there was really not much need for me to do it. What I took, did was take a lot of their data, a analyze it in a few ways, and then append it to my mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I did, but mine was a, was a quantitative, a, a qualitative, field, field-oriented report. And the response to that was, how on earth did you learn all of that in the four months that you mm -hmm. did, had to do the study? I mean, they, not only did people recognize the, the, the organization, mm -hmm. um, they were really surprised that someone else who, who wasn't working mm -hmm. there. And that one was, to some extent, a, a matter of hanging out and, and, and listening sympathetically mm -hmm. and asking questions from time to time um, and putting it together. But experiences like that uh, you know, do sort of convince people that, yeah, there is, a, there is definitely a role. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I said that things like values, beliefs, matter, mm -hmm. matter to people. Um, they like talking about them, and they're, and they're glad when people understand the importance of them. And I think people who, who have been studied or, or who need to work from studies, if they haven't realized that those that were the things that were missing, they often realize that things were missing. Mm -hmm. If you had to list the, the, the two projects that you were most uh, pleased with that they were your the projects that you felt that had the greatest contribution to the field of criminal justice and criminology. Uh, what would be those two projects, and and why would you choose those two of the many that you have you have done over the years? Well, it's sort of embarrassing to say that that one of the ones I think I would choose was my very first thing in in criminal justice. Um, which was a, a monograph entitled A Functional Approach to Police Corruption. And I guess the reason I like that one so much is that that, with all its flaws, um, convinced me that, that there was something mm -hmm. here to do. Um, and, and this was actually a, a part of a study that, that um, Dick Ward at John Jay uh, had gotten NIJ funding to do a study of police corruption. And, and part of the, the grant called for a number of monographs and a number of things. Uh, I, it, it worked out that, that, I, that I was to, to do one. Well, here was somebody who knew, who knew extremely little about police, let alone police corruption mm -hmm. at, at, at that point. And it was also a very, it was still a very taboo topic um, that, at that point. Police, most police were not talking about corruption at all. It doesn't happen. It's mm -hmm. the occasional 
rotten apple. Mm -hmm. And if they did admit to any more than that, they said, well, yes, there's corruption in policing, but also in business and government. And, mm -hmm. and why aren't you paying attention to those people? Mm -hmm. Why are you always picking on us? Exactly. So it was a difficult topic to talk about. Um, and what I tried to do was take straight Mertonian functionalism and apply it. I said, I mean, if, 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 corruption, if police corruption has continued this long after so many efforts to do something about it, and I think what impressed me was how much of it was petty, that it, mm -hmm. that it, wasn't, that it wasn't just greed, that it seemed to me if, if, if what you were trying to, to do was, was, was simply material-oriented. Mm -hmm. If you wanted more money, there were so many other easier, safer ways of getting it, even getting it Ill illegally. Some of, some of these people took huge risks for very little mm -hmm. payoff. I said, there must be something else going on here. It must be filling some other need, mm -hmm. personal or, or organizational. And, and so a lot of reading, a lot of talking, um, a lot of Merton. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to identify the functions that corruption could fill for an organization, mm -hmm. not for individuals, in, in, in terms of rite of passage, in terms of the peculiar kind of rank structure that we have in, in, um, in, in American police departments. And, um, and I was satisfied with it. And to my great pleasure, so were a number of, of police chiefs who read it. And in fact, again, to the idea that they that they recognized themselves in this, and that was so, so good. And I think that's, that's very important because police are very difficult to convince. Yeah. Like most of yeah. us are when we're yes. forced to look when at we're ourselves. Oh, we that, hate Oh, we don't studied. see that. We, ju we just hate, and we academics are as bad as anybody else. I mean, can you, well, you know, we, we in the field sometimes talk about how closed police mm -hmm. organizations are. They're more open than exactly. anybody, and certainly more than, than universities. I mean, can you imagine having some social scientists come in and study us? Well, I, I was recently at a conference, and someone said that uh, NIJ should sponsor uh, monies for the police departments to study Maybe. universities. Yeah. Because um, I think it would be wonderful to be at, at, yeah. at the other end the of that. Yeah. And you're yeah. right. No one studies yeah. universities. and. It would be very interesting to see what the police would find out about uh, universities and, and how they operate. And one of the things that is difficult, and, and, and we anthropologists learned this the, the hard way, you know, in, in, in the old days of anthropology, you, you, you know, you went to some island where, where, uh, where people were, were preliterate, and you took lots of notes, and then you came home and you wrote mm -hmm. your book, which nobody on that island ever, ever mm -hmm. saw. And so you were quite safe from that kind of criticism. Um, but one of the things that we've learned, and it's certainly true for those of us who work with criminal justice uh, organizations, is that what we try to do as social scientists is to study organizations objectively. Mm -hmm. And nobody likes to be described objectively. They like to be described favorably. Exactly. And so what we see as a totally neutral statement, the subject of that statement will see as criticism. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's mm -hmm. real trouble there. So, if it, so yes, the ability to, to say something that's honest and meaningful that does not offend the subject of it is, is rare mm -hmm. <laughs> and very gratifying when it happens. And what was the second one? That was the first one, and I can see right. what, how, how exciting that must have been that you did something, you could see that there's truly relevance here, there's a lot going on here, the connection with the criminal justice agency, the police department. Well, the second one is, would not be a research project, actually. I think the second thing that I've done that, that comes to mind mm -hmm. as you ask that question is my 12 years as the editor of Police Studies, the International Review of Police mm -hmm. Development. Um, because that's the other side of what of, I've done as an anthropologist, and, and that is approach things from a comparative point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I started doing that at a, at a time when not many people did. Um, David Bailey, um, Frida Adler, and Gerhard Mueller, and I think I've just identified them. Um, mm -hmm. And we, at the time, um, um, John Stead, who, who had spent many years as the academic dean at, at Brams Hill, the, Eng the English mm -hmm. Police Staff College, um, was at John Jay, and, and he, with his English publisher, uh, wanted to start a journal on, on international policing, written articles 
written by people from different countries, but also articles written by persons from one country studying another. And um, everyone told them there was no market, and they were quite right, there was no market. Um, nobody was interested in, in that kind of, of thing. Um, but John and Charles Parker, his, his, his editor and his publisher in England, uh, a wonderful person, decided they'd do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, soon after they started, however, um, John decided to retire in part for health reasons um, and was good enough to hand his baby on to me. And I think both the fact that I um, got that journal out four times a year, mostly with, a f with fairly interesting uh, content, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and if the market was never huge, it certainly grew over the years. And um, the articles in it are, are now constantly cited. Some, some indeed have been, become classics. But um, we had, a w um, the market was, a, might have been small, but it was an international one. It mm -hmm. was a worldwide market. And so the idea that police and scholars of police in different countries were reading about police and scholars of mm -hmm. police in different countries on a regular basis, that I could encourage people who had not thought of writing to, to write, um, that I could encourage people who had not thought of, of doing comparative research to, to do it because here was a place to publish it, mm -hmm. um, is one of those things that I, that, that I find very, very gratifying. Not to mention the fact that, that police studies provided a wonderful introduction for me almost everywhere I went. Dorothy, can you tell me about your work in China? I know that you've gone over to China and you've uh, lectured over there, and I know that you've taken uh, Dr. Rick Terrell from Georgia State has gone over. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's one of the things I know a lot about you, Dorothy, but uh, that's one of the things I've always wanted to, to ask you more about, and mm -hmm. now here's the opportunity. Um, well, this is, this is a bit of a full circle, and, and one of the things I particularly loved about my career, you know, after I stopped digging those holes. Mm -hmm. um, and you didn't get to China that way. And I way, didn't right? get to China that way. Um, I got as close as I could to Hong Kong when I was doing my, my doctoral work um, in the late 60s, early 70s. And, um, and then was able to go back a time or two to Hong Kong after that. Uh, the, the village that I studied was, um, was removed because they were building a reservoir where it used to be. So. Uh, they were moved into a market town, and I went and studied them there and mm -hmm. did a bit of that. Um, but then the time came when I really had to make up my mind, because at that time, in the, in the early 70s, Americans were not going to China. And whether I wanted to make a career as, as an anthropologist of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. or whether I, need, I wanted to do more in, in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, I had my first sabbatical coming up, and the question was, what, what would I do with that year? And it was a, it, it was a branching mm -hmm. time. And what I decided to do, I, I was very fortunate to be admitted into the tiny little program that Yale Law School has, which is Master of Studies in Law, um, which is for people who would benefit from a formal study of law, but it don't need to be lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that's what to do with that year. And I kind of left China behind to, to mm -hmm. some extent. And then in the, in the mid-80s, China slowly started opening up to visits from foreigners, and particularly in the form of foreign delegations, mm -hmm. people who were interested in a particular topic. And I thought, I can't, I can't miss this opportunity, even if it's just to do it mm -hmm. one time, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to look at the Chinese criminal justice system, no matter how remotely or anything. I, I want to do that. Um, and so that was a three-week trip. And here again, at Police Studies was, was such a, a wonderful opportunity. We, um, those of us in our, well, there were about 12 of us in, 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 this, in this group, which was sponsored by the Eisenhower Foundation, and some interested in police, some in courts, some in mediation, corrections. Um, but arrangement was made for those of us who were interested in police to, to meet, have lunch with, in Beijing with some high-ranking officers. And when I sat at my appointed place in the table, um, somebody had walked over with, with, a, with a brochure from Anderson Publishing Company. Anderson had taken over police studies by then. Um, and, and there was the, the advertisement for police studies, and my name as editor underlined. And, and, and I said, you know, was that me? And I 
I said, yes, that was me. You know, I didn't realize that police studies was, was known in China. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, it's well known in China, at which point I said, I can go home now. You know, this trip has no more to <laughs> offer me. Um, but police studies was an entree for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, the, the Chinese police researchers, I think, saw from that that I was mm -hmm. not a dilettante. This was not just a, you mm -hmm. know, a way to come to China and you know, buy scrolls. Um, and and it, it, it just it opened up a, a number of, of real possibilities for me with, with, with Chinese researchers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was invited on a, on a number of occasions to uh, to come back to lecture, and in in those days I don't think it's as true now. But the Chinese were still very sensitive. Oh, oh other the, the fact that they could tell by some of my earlier publications that I'd had this long interest mm -hmm. in in China, um, and again was was not just jumping in on new opportunities, um, but I was quickly put into the category of friend of China. And in, in fact, after a while, it became old friend of China. Um, and so the, the invitations to, to, to lecture at the Public Security University were always accompanied by opportunities to visit other organizations in other parts of, mm -hmm. of China. And the, the one that you're talking about, um, where I was asked to bring two other people mm -hmm. with me so that we could do it as a team. Um, uh, Rick Terrell, who had written on oh, compar comparative justice. works. And uh, the other member of my team was the head of the uh, National Police Research Unit in Australia, where, I, where I'd worked for a while. And, um, and the three of us just, just had a wonderful time. And we saw, again, because we were, we were a little group, all of, all of us pretty good bona fides. Mm -hmm. um, we had some long, long bus rides, which gave some wonderful opportunities to talk you know, without anybody mm -hmm. else around you know you, when, when you're sitting with, with, with your Chinese friend mm -hmm. you know on a bus and there's no one mm -hmm. else around um, things open up in a way that they don't in more formal situations um, so I spent um, I'd say I had a, a, a run of a good 10 years in, in which much of what I wrote about and studied was was Chinese mm -hmm criminal justice and I became particularly interested in a, in a particular piece of legislation um, which, which gives the police certain, gives the police powers in, in things probably that we would call violations mm -hmm. um, to arrest, adjudicate, and sentence without ever going to the courts. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of followed the revisions of that legislation over the years trying to put those revisions in a cultural context into what else was happening in, in China and the history of it. So that, that was, and to some extent, continues to mm -hmm. be you know, a wonderful interest to bring my very early interest in China together with my later interest in criminal justice and do, and do Chinese criminal justice. I think, I think we should share, share some time with, uh, today talking about what it was like, I've always wondered it, and I've, I've asked this of you before on, on se separate occasions where you and I have talked. What was it like being, the, being elected to the presidency of the ACJS back in the, I believe you were elected in 1984, 83, 84? I think the election to the second vice presidency, mm -hmm. which leads inevitably to the, to the presidency, must have been... Um, Maybe maybe eighty two because my presidential year I you think was eighty four eighty five eighty five because this is uh, we're talking about the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences which um, its name was changed in nineteen seventy from the International Association of Police Professors mm -hmm. which was founded in nineteen sixty three which was an uh, an offshoot so to speak of the American Society of Criminology which started back in the forties and as you and I know and these organizations were predominantly male organizations. So it's quite a, uh, an accomplishment for a woman to become the, uh, the, uh, the to be elected second VP back in the in the 80s. Uh, how did that? And, and it didn't happen again until and well it, into the 90s. And it didn't happen again <laughs> until a decade later. Yeah. Uh, what was that like? I, you know, I think that's important for for us to spend a little time here today talking about. Um, did you have particular strategies? I'm, I'm certain that it was because of, uh, you and I both talked about this as well, that we had done lots of work for the academy. Mm -hmm. So we certainly had yeah. the, uh, the credentials to do that. And we put our time in the, in the salt mine, so to speak. Yeah. But how did that come about? 
Well, I think that that is what 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 worked, and it's interesting that more than ten years later, for you, it's 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 what worked again, um, and and I think many many of the men who have become president have also done that, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. And and I think you know in many cases for women it is still the way that we need to do it. I started um, well, it was the result of good mentoring to some extent. Um, when I started listening to all those police stories and said, I, I think I want to do some more in this, um, Don Riddle, who, who was the president of John Jay at the time and had been one of the early presidents of, mm -hmm. of, of a, in, in, in its old name, in mm -hmm. fact, um, and Dick Ward, who was vice president of ACJS and would also become a president, of, oh, well, it's vice president of John Jay and would also become a president of ACJS, um, suggested that I, that I join ACJS, one of the better pieces of advice that I ever got. And there was a, there was a very funny little, little newsletter, which nobody, as, as always, you know, with, with voluntary organizations. And, and, you know, we had no money, among, mm -hmm. among other things. Um, nobody wanted to do the newsletter, because doing the newsletter meant doing the newsletter mm -hmm. from, from top to bottom. And, and Dick Ward, I think, sort of pushed me into it. He, he said, you know, he'd supply, he, he was in charge of the, of the college's printing office, and he said, you know, he could do that. I only had yeah. to do everything else. Yeah. Um, and, and so I did that, and I can't even say it was a tremendous newsletter. There was a lot of cut and paste uh, in, in it. But it did come out on a fairly regular basis. And again, you know, so I had some name recognition, mm -hmm. I suppose. And, but the, the real jump came um, when I ran for, and, and, and again, this was a result of some mentoring, mm -hmm. um, the job of secretary treasurer. Now, in those days, um, there was no secretariat. There was no national office. Mm -hmm. There was there there was nothing. Um, the academy lived in the office of whoever was secretary treasurer at the time. Um, and 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 looking back, it was a, it was an incredible amount of work. In fact, such an incredible amount of work that I was the last person to do it. I had two terms as secretary and treasurer. And after that, we we did establish a national office with a paid staff and and, and all of that. But what those two years did for me, and I, and I really don't underestimate this, is is every piece of mail that went out from ACJS to mm -hmm. its membership had my name on mm -hmm. it. Now a lot of that mail was was asking for money, telling people it was time to pay their dues, telling people they hadn't paid their dues and they better do it now, telling them they needed mm -hmm. to register for the annual meeting. Um, but as years went by, people forgot why they knew they, my name, but they just remembered that mm -hmm. they knew my name. Mm -hmm. And the other was, because there was no secretariat, because I was the secretariat, I knew everything about the academy. I knew mm -hmm. everybody in it. You know, they, they, it wasn't that big, but because I kept the membership list, I did all of the mm -hmm. correspondence. Um, I really felt that I had a personal relationship with, with a huge proportion of the members of the, of the academy, something which, which simply was no longer true when we got um, a professional staff and when the membership grew to the, the, way, it, the way it has now. Um, but I think then when I, when I ran for second vice president, there, there was the, the feeling on the part of people who gave it any thought that, that I had indeed paid my mm -hmm. dues and, and fair was fair. And on the part of people who didn't give it any thought, well, this is a name that's familiar to us. We're not quite sure why, <laughs> but it is. Um, and, and I think that that was really what had done it. I, I, I honestly think that even, you know, if I'd had superb scholarly credentials, but not mm -hmm. the service to the academy, um, particularly for that organization, uh, a woman as president would just have seemed a, a strange thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in my case, we, you know, because of that history mm -hmm. of service to the academy, the, the inevitability of it was, was really what, what carried me through. As I've said mm -hmm. to you, you know, they, they, they did that, and then the academy kind of breathed a sigh of relief and said, we've had our woman president. Mm -hmm. We don't ever have to do that again, mm -hmm. um, and, and didn't uh, until you followed a rather, a rather similar path. Actually. And I think it, it's, uh, it's interesting because very similar to you, I was... Uh, uh, secretary treasurer, and I was. It was also mm -hmm. someone uh, had asked me to to run for secretary treasurer because 
it is a very responsible position for the the academy and you're absolutely correct everyone sees your name mm -hmm. you have the you have the checkbook you know you know the investments you know what's going on you take the minutes yeah. you, know, you do everything but unlike you I did work with with Patty Delancey our executive director so there was two of us mm -hmm. um, but I think what you're saying is correct to be an elected in our organization is that we have to put the service in yeah and I had been before that time the trustee at large. Yes. So again, and so your name I've was known and, and followed along, and, and people and people did know. The other thing, of course, is and I think when you were secretary treasurer, you had, you had some of the same thing. Well, I was very involved in, in putting on the annual meeting, mm -hmm. and no one else was going to do it. And I applaud you for that <laughs> because secretary, when I was secretary treasurer, we didn't secretary yeah. treasurer didn't do that. But uh, but again, it meant you had your finger in every single yes. pie, and. Um, and you got all the credit and all the blame, both mm -hmm. of them. But again, back to the idea, it was funny, even when you got the blame, um, people knew, people knew, <laughs> they knew the name, you know? Name. Yeah. And that's, I yeah. think that's important, and it's important to... Uh, I mean, those people who say, you know, say anything you like about me, but spell my name mm -hmm. right, you know, have, have something. That's, that's right. Have something. I think that's important uh, for people who are interested in, uh, in running for office, uh, um, the significance of of service to yeah, the academy yeah. that's particularly if yeah. you're female that you need I, to have the service i, I agree I that so. there have been other individuals who have been elected to positions who don't have as much service i think for, for men there, there there are more there are more roads mm -hmm. more ways of of getting there and i'm sure that will be true for women mm -hmm. eventually but but for right now certainly the the best way, mm -hmm. let's put it that way, the, the tried and true way, mm -hmm. um, is, is through service. And I'm not sure that that's a bad thing no, either. No. Um, it brings you to the presidency really knowing the organization, having a feel for its history, for its membership, which I think mm -hmm. is a tremendous asset. Sort of the scholar versus service. Mm -hmm. Someone who's a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a tremendous scholar gets elected to a position, but if they don't know the background because of the lack of service, yeah. They're going to have a very difficult we're no, time. We're knowing the people. Being I mean, president. again, through your, you know, your work as trustee, and mm -hmm. then, and then, all those years on the board, um, you, you, you know, you, you know who the players mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and you know what what people want, mm -hmm. and you know what kind of compromises can be arrived at. I must say that I had a wonderful year as president. I, I had a, a, a fantastic board, which was wonderfully mm -hmm. supportive, and one of the reasons was I I knew them all before mm -hmm. they got there. We'd all worked together. Um, I, I had a very good idea of what really mattered to who and, and, and where where X would compromise and mm -hmm. where X would not. And I mm -hmm. wouldn't f force X to compromise where he where he really wouldn't. So things went very, very smoothly, I think, as as a as a result of that. And and it and it was indeed um, a real asset. The only thing they wouldn't let me do was serve salmon at the at the lunch and I was said They wouldn't let you do that? No, the only oh. the only time in that whole year where they um, where they objected to one of my decisions and did you have? And I, and I caved. I you, caved. You had chicken. I had chicken. You had chicken. It was, it, I, I went out in defeat. What can I say? I had chicken. But they said, you know, people either really like salmon or they really don't, don't like, like salmon. salmon. And chicken's always safe. Uh, safe, safe, safe. Safe. So it sounds like that uh, your recommendation for people coming onto the into the academy is to get the service. You know, yeah. get, get your name known. Learn as much as possible about the academy. And not just for the purpose of, of, of running for higher office, although I'm certainly glad I did, and I, you know, I, I enjoyed my year as president, and I've enjoyed all my years as ex-president. But um, also be, because I think being involved in the academy is, is an awfully mm -hmm. good thing, and particularly in, in criminal justice, so many of our people are in, are in small colleges where the criminal justice departments are, are small, or it may not even be departments, but, you know, somebody who teaches criminal justice in a sociology mm -hmm. department. Um, this is the, really the opportunity to find colleagueship and mm -hmm. companionship and intellectual stimulation um, and, and to be in it in a way other than simply attending the meeting though I don't, and reading the journal, though I certainly don't um, downplay mm -hmm. either of those. Uh, but to have a little bit of behind the scenes experience is, you know, it's just a wonderful way to meet people mm -hmm. and, and, and feel that you're part of part of the field, I think, so that, that, that even if you have no interest in, in running for office or running for higher office, um, being involved in, in, in committees of one form or another for doing some kind of service um, is a good thing, I think. I do. I recommend mm -hmm. it to, to people of all genders. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's uh, the best way to do it is get out there and uh, 
as uh, I think it was Robert Parks that said, go out and get, get your hands dirty when he sent, him, sent the uh, graduate students out to uh, do field research. He yes. said uh, they were all male students, so he said, go, gentlemen, go out and get your hands dirty mm -hmm. and you know, uh, learn it by doing it. One of the, the wonderful That's things a paraphrase. about it is, is um, to watch the way an annual meeting works. I mean, e the truth is that even people who, who, who criticize, um, think of all the things that they don't criticize. Mm -hmm. But when you're behind the scenes, when you realize that the whole thing is really held together with bailing wire and chewing gum, mm -hmm. it, 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 it just is a, you know, a wonderful series of insights. and, and um, and helps you appreciate what mm -hmm. goes on, but also everything else that you go to. I mean, every every other event that mm -hmm. I go to now, I you know I, I look at it from the point of view of someone who's dealt with the caterers mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. uh, and the people who supply the overheads and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I, I mean, you again, talk, you know, talk about learning about organizations mm -hmm. and the culture. It's good. What about some of your students? Um, any of the students that I'm sure there's many of them that you have um, had that you've had the benefit of seeing them, you know, mature as, as academics. Uh, are there any that uh, that you had a close working relationship with that uh, you feel as a you know a, you had the greatest impact on? Um, there haven't been too many. John Jay's doctoral program as a as a program of any size isn't that old. I suppose I can. There are two that that come to mind. Um, one is Peter Horn, mm -hmm. um, one of the few men who's done work on, on and did women and did policing. Did on women and policing, policing exactly, um, and has continued to yeah, work on women and yes, policing. Yes, um, and um, so I've, I've followed his career with with uh, with great pleasure. And of course, now now comes one of the bonuses of having successful students. I, w I was just called in to be the outside evaluator of the pro of the program that he runs at uh, at Mercer County. Um, another person who's, whose work I take a, a certain amount of pride in is, is Samson Oli, who, who came to us from Nigeria with the, with the idea of, of going back. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was particularly nice to Samson because I always thought he'd be Minister of Justice in mm -hmm. Nigeria, and I saw myself being received with limousines <laughs> and red carpets. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that, he, he decided for a number of reasons to stay in the United States. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the, the work that he has done um, in, in trying to uh, to bring the point of view not of an African American but of an African mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody uh, who comes from a, a totally different culture but but has you know talk and when he discusses the American criminal justice system he, he does it so much with the the, the background of a system which, which uh, emphasizes reconciliation and restitution. Um, ra rather than punishment mm -hmm. or or, or, um, or inca incapacitation, um, the role of the non-professionals, mm -hmm. uh, the integration of customary law with um, um, with with uh, with common law. I mean, I I'm, I'm just constantly impressed by by the insights that he brings. Um, I should mention, in, in all fairness, however, my, what I think of as my other graduate students, and that was I was, I was um, fortunate enough to spend a semester um, as the George Beto professor at Sam, Sam Houston, Houston State, uh, where I dealt only with the, um, with the, with the doctoral students. And uh, again, there's se several of them not, whose careers I've not only followed with pride, but, but have been to some extent inter intertwined with Vic Kapler, mm -hmm. uh, who edits one of the ACJS journals at the moment. Um, and I, he flattered me by asking mm -hmm. me to write an introduction to one of his, his books. Um, and I, I, he, he was a, uh, a good and, and, and delightfully contentious student from time to time in my mm -hmm. class. And I take, um, I don't want to take away from, from what the people at Sam Houston did, mm -hmm. did for him, and he'd be the first to acknowledge them. But I like to feel I had a little something to do with that. Um, and I, I believe, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Vic Kapler has agreed to do the biographical essay for you on you for women in criminal justice. I didn't even realize I that. I think I talked yeah. him into it, oh. and I think we were waiting until uh, after Neat. JQ. Because I, yeah. I think he agreed to do that. Well, that's that's so nice see, thing to hear. Thank you for the nice. news. So that's, yes. uh, Thank you for the good news. Shows yes. the inf but, but it shows yeah. the influence that uh, I think I was talking with him about. We should do one of these biographical okay. essays on Dorothy for this journal. Yeah. And I said, I wonder who could do that. 
knowing his <laughs> past relationship, he said, well, I might be able to do that. So that's quite right. a compliment. Yeah. Um, Mike Vaughn, uh, mm -hmm. another Sam Houston student who, who, um, who was the book review editor for um, Journal of Criminal Justice Education when I was the, the editor and uh, um, did a wonderful job and of course is, is again in, in, in comparative mm -hmm. work, particularly Asia, is, is really making his mark mm -hmm. and I feel I had a little something to do with that. Uh, Mike Blankenship. Mm -hmm. uh, Editing and writing away, and you're naming okay. all these people. You know that uh, it's it's interesting, Dorothy, hearing you name these individuals. That uh, these are also individuals who I think are following your footsteps in the, the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences because the Kapler is the JQ yes. editor. Yes, I hadn't thought uh, about that. Mike Vaughn was the book review editor for our journal, Journal of Criminal Justice mm -hmm. Education. Michael Blankenship is uh, the program chair Here. for the 1998 yes. yeah. Yeah. meeting in Albuquerque. Yeah. And you'll just keep going, and I bet everyone I can just yeah. target them right back. And it just goes back to Edwin Sutherland. So the approach that that uh, professors have on their students, and then they go and they influence, and then you you have these tremendous contributions to the field of criminal justice. Well, so often, particularly new new doctoral students, just just don't think along these lines. I mean, doing something as as simple as walking into the first day of of class with membership applications mm -hmm. and saying, "Do this." Mm -hmm. Um, get some started on the right mm -hmm. on the right road very often. Were there any uh, when you talked about being at Sam Houston and this goes back again to our field of, of uh, criminal justice that there now are more women and more no and minorities coming into mm -hmm. the, uh, criminal mm -hmm. justice. But were there any um, women um, doctoral students or masters? Yeah, La students? Laura Myers is one that I certainly um, think think back mm -hmm. fond fondly of. Yeah, I mean, we're beginning, we're really beginning to see now um, the, uh, the, there's always this talk about there, there aren't enough women in the pipeline. Well, the pipeline mm -hmm. is now, is now rapidly filling up. I mean, if that was ever a good excuse, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not anymore. And it's been interesting to watch the changes in, in mm -hmm. classes over the, over the my, my undergraduate class uh, at the moment, an interesting Thing. Um, I have them divided in, into groups, mm -hmm. for all the, and in making up the groups, I, I tried to make them as equal as possible in terms of, of the students' majors, in terms of their, their GPA, um, their, uh, their year in, mm -hmm. in college, and things like that. And I realized as I was doing it that we had a real scarcity of men in the class. That the PM, oh they, yeah, it was men and, and people who could make good use of the internet was what gave me good problems in equalizing these groups. Mm -hmm. Each group had to have one internet expert and, and one guy. Mm -hmm. um, but my class is so full of women; they just aren't. And um, when I first started, um, when, when we first started the doctoral program at, at, at John Jay. Um, we were very proud that we had something like 20 percent women, mm -hmm. and I don't have the number now, but I'd be surprised if it's less than 50 percent. I've always kidded oh, about wonderful. the fact when I first started going to ACJS meetings, I never had to wait online at the ladies' room, ah. and, and now, so, so things yeah, are changing. It, it, yeah. Well, one of the things that's really happened to criminal justice, it seems to me, is that it's it's gone from being a a thing having to do with police in particular, um, there were always, I think, more women interested in mm -hmm. corrections. Mm, definitely. Uh, to being a social science, mm -hmm. and, and social science is a, is a field which has always been attractive to and open to women. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, uh, you know, as, as it's seen as, you know, being not too different from sociology, as opposed to a vocational field which prepares people for careers mm -hmm. in policing. Um, just just as um, as women are interested in and have done well in the other social sciences, they they do to us too, and, mm -hmm. and that may be as good a measure as any of, of the of this change of, of criminal justice from being a vocationally oriented mm -hmm. to being an academically oriented field. The number of women mm -hmm. in it. So as we're, we're seeing the numbers increasing uh, day by day. Yeah. Dorothy, what do you see the future direction of your scholarship? Um, or your involvement with uh, ACJS, or um, well, I what are you working on? You know, what are you working on? Well, actually, what I'm working on at, at the moment has nothing to do 
in, in terms of subject matter with anything that I've worked on before, and, and that is I'm doing some work on, on Native Americans in the criminal justice system. Um, particularly the, the, the theme I've taken is that we as social scientists know that there are certain institutions um, involvement in which keep people law-abiding, mm -hmm. or conformist, I suppose, is another way of putting mm -hmm. it, and that the, that the American legal system has carefully undermined all of these in, in Native American mm -hmm. culture. Um, so that people are, I mean, one of the things that, that not much attention has been paid to, people like, like Cormac Mann have, have tried to call attention to the incredibly high rate of, um, of, of crime mm -hmm. uh, among Native Americans, but both urban mm -hmm. and, and, in fact, that's one of the things that's interesting. It's not, it's all the thing, the, the theories that we so often use that have to do with, with urbanism and uprooting and all of that, and that the, uh, the crime rate goes down as you go into rural areas. The crime rates on, on um, in Indian country are often higher than mm -hmm. they are among similar, you know, people of the same group living in, in urban areas. Um, and, and, and so the idea that many of these institutions, parts of, you know, that Indian culture has been destroyed is a cliche, a true cliche, but a cliche nevertheless. Um, but, but the role that the law has had in destroying the mechanisms that keep people law-abiding mm -hmm. is, is what's been interesting mm -hmm. me at the moment, so particularly when it comes to things like, uh, like religion. Mm -hmm. I know you missed it uh, yesterday because you weren't able to be with yes, us until no, last night. I was very sorry about Chief that. Chief Justice uh, Robert uh, Yazi, who's the Chief Justice of the Navajo mm -hmm. Nation, was our plenary mm -hmm. yesterday, and he was talking about uh, peacemaking mm -hmm. and um, the religion and how that differs. Yeah. So that, uh, I thought of you, though. I knew that uh, you would want to be there. Yes, and I, sometimes I, that really did. Did, did hurt. So the academy is, is, is changing in that way as well as in looking at uh, yeah. bringing in, we had a number of uh, Oh, there was a time when the academy law. thought it was being really on the cutting edge when it brought someone in from England. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, the fact that we're, that, that, we, that we are beginning mm -hmm. to think as broadly as, as we can. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole idea of things like mediation, peacemaking, restitution, mm -hmm. that, that the idea of, of the of of, of the system is, is, is to bring people back together, to, uh, to, me, to mend the whole and, and, mm -hmm. and send them on again, is, is just such radical thinking for, for people raised in the common law where the only possible verdicts are guilty or not mm -hmm. guilty, uh, and, and where inevitably you leave the courtroom, um, or somebody leaves the courtroom unhappier than mm -hmm. they were when they came in. Um, and, and the fact, I mean, it's a wonderful thing for our country, but it's a wonderful thing that people in our profession mm -hmm. right, are, 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 are leading and directing that kind of thinking. Good for us, I say. Yes. I think a, a, a final discussion should be on, if you were looking back at, at your life, Dorothy, would there be anything that you would change as far as uh, your your academic background? Would you have, perhaps, if you'd known that you were going to be in criminal justice, gone into a, a, a different field of study or uh, been diversified in, in other ways? Uh, what would you have done I'm, differently? I'm you not could sure that things? there is very much I would have done differently, although if I were to come back, things would would be different. The, re the reason I say that is because I've just been so terribly lucky. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the good things that I've done have have not been things that I planned. Um, one, of the, one of the things I try to, to, to tell my juniors um, is to be open mm -hmm. to opportunities as they come along. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to keep pushing the academy, because academy is not the only way of doing it. But um, opportunities don't tend to come along if, you, if you're simply sitting at your desk mm -hmm. or, or even you know, sitting in library stacks, mm -hmm. wonderful as, as it is to mm -hmm. do those things. Um, but can, you need to be out there a, a bit for lightning mm -hmm. to strike you. Mm -hmm. But so many of the things when I look back and say, you know, what, what, has, what has really been good? What have I loved doing? Where, where do I think I've done something that, that mattered? Uh, so much of it has, has been more or less an accident. Um, but I like to think that I 
that I worked at, at placing myself mm -hmm. in the right places. So part of my advice, I suppose, would be is not not to plan too much, not not to tie oneself down mm -hmm. um, to things that that make it impossible to see or to take advantage of the of the opportunities that that come along. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you very much today for being with us and discussing your how you got into criminal justice, what you've been doing in criminal justice, and your, uh, your future directions. And it's very great to have you here. Thank, thank you, you, Donna.